Welcome to the American Wordsmith channel, a show aimed to inspire readers to cherish the most meaningful moments found in life by learning about the mid-19th century, 1850 to 1906 lifestyle. Subscribe for more content on aspects of my business and writing life, as well as topics concerning mid-19th century living, child rearing, and much more. I will be sharing several interesting excerpts from the books that I have been reading as of late. This one is an etiquette book for gentlemen written by Mrs. Humphrey, a late Victorian novelist, in 1897, entitled Manners for Men. I will also put the link to the full text at the end of the excerpts if you want to read the complete work. Let's begin. Apart from faults of temper, men fall into careless habits of speech and manner at home, and one form of this, viz. habitually using strong language in the presence of women and children, is particularly offensive. Besides, it defeats itself, for if the forcible expressions are intended to express disapprobation, they soon become weak and powerless to do so, because they are used on every possible occasion. After a time, they lose all meaning. The strict rule is that when walking with a lady, a man should never leave her side. Sometimes ladies are very anxious to take the reins and drive themselves, a circumstance which has often occasioned agonies of nervousness to other women on the coach. It is quite possible to refuse such requests in a polite and gentlemanly way, partly by seeming to ignore it or laughing it off. The old-fashioned rule that a man must approach the father of a girl before offering himself in marriage to her has now, to some extent, died out. The usual way to ask for the admired one's hand in marriage is in person. This is always preferable to writing, though some men have not the courage to adopt the first course. Should the lady accept the offer, the happy wooer must take the earliest opportunity of seeing her father, or failing him, her nearest friend, and begging him to permit the engagement. Should he consent, all is well, but in the contrary case, his decision must be accepted. Immediately upon having the engagement ratified, the accepted suitor gives the lady an engagement ring. This should be as handsome a present as he can afford to buy. Together with all other presents and correspondence on both sides, this ring must be returned if the engagement should be broken off. No man should drag a girl into a long engagement, nor should any man propose to a girl until he is in a position to provide for her. He is only standing in the way of other wooers who may be well supplied with this world's gear. Such trifles as wealth and ease may appear as naught to the mind of the youthful lover, not to be weighed for a moment in the balance with love and young romance. The girl, too, may be of the same way of thinking at the time, but it the more behooves the man, the stronger, to consider her and to remember that poverty is such a bitter and a cruel thing that it even kills love at times. Custom demands that the bridegroom shall present her bouquet to the bride, as well as bouquets and a present each to the bridesmaids. He must furnish the house for the bride in every detail, not excepting the house and table linen, which in the old days of spinning wheels was wont to be contributed by the bride herself. He must provide the wedding ring and the carriage in which his best man and himself go to church. He pays the fees to clergymen and clerk, but it is the best man who hands them over. With him the bridegroom waits at the altar till the bride arrives. She takes her place at his left hand for the first time, and at the proper moment he produces the ring, which is the symbol of their union. The usual dress of a bridegroom consists of a very dark blue frock coat, light trousers, light or white scarf tie, patent boots, and a new hat. Addresses of Letters Her Majesty the Queen To His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales To Her Royal Highness the Princess of Wales this same form is used in addressing communications to all other members of the royal family, adding the title where the word prince or princess would be incorrect, as to His Royal Highness the Duke of York, to Her Royal Highness the Duchess of York. Below the rank of royalty there is the distinction between letters addressed by persons on an equality with those to whom formal and they write and by inferiors. Address for the envelope, formal and informal. I shall call them formal and informal, and range them in separate lines. Informal. The Duke of, the Duchess of, the Marquis of, the Marchioness of, the Earl of, the Countess of, the Viscount of, the Viscountess, Lord, Lady. Formal. To His Grace the Duke of, to Her Grace the Duchess of, to the Most Honorable the Marquis of, to the Most Honorable the Marchioness of, to the Right Honorable the Earl of, to the Right Honorable the Countess of, the Right Honorable Viscount, the Right Honorable the Viscountess, the Right Honorable Lord or Baron, 
the right honorable lady or baroness. Addressing privy councillors, members of the privy council are also addressed as right honorable in the same way as peers. In this case, the name of commoners are not followed by the abbreviation Esquire as the right honorable James Balfour, MP. Ambassadors. Ambassadors and their wives are addressed as His Excellency, Her Excellency, the personal and official titles following the word as To His Excellency, the Earl of Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to France To Her Excellency, the Countess of Other official personages are addressed in the following way To His Excellency, Lord Blank, Lord Lieutenant of Ireland To His Grace, the Archbishop of the Right Reverend the Bishop of, the Very Reverend the Dean of. Degrees. Academical distinctions are indicated by the initials placed after the name, LLD for Doctor of Laws and Learning, DD for Doctor of Divinity, and so on. Beginning the letter. So much for the envelopes. The proper way to begin letters is as follows. As I have mentioned, the Queen is addressed as Madam in the inside of a letter, a gentleman writing, to the Queen, to the Queen would sign himself. I have the honor to submit myself with profound respect your Majesty's most devoted subject and servant. And the above word Madam should be written Her Majesty the Queen. Lord Beaconsfield struck out a line of his own and in writing to the Queen began Mr. Disraeli, continuing in the third person and addressing Her Majesty in the second. To the Prince and Princess of Wales. The Prince of Wales is addressed as Sir, above this word being written to His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. Persons on intimate terms sometimes begin Sir or Dear Prince, others My Dear Prince. The Princess of Wales is occasionally addressed by friends as My Dear Princess. The two orthodox endings to such letters are respectfully Your Royal Highness's dutiful and obedient servant, or a humbler style, Your Royal Highness's dutiful and most obedient servant. To all other royal princes and princesses, the ending would be most humble and obedient servant. To a duke and duchess. Dukes other than royal are addressed inside letters by intimates as dear duke. By others, my lord duke, may it please your grace. In writing to a duchess, her title is placed above the madam. In formal letters, marquises would be addressed as my lord marquis. On omitting Christian names from courtesy titles. A very common form of mistake is that of omitting the Christian name from the courtesy titles of the sons and daughters of dukes, marquises, and earls. The sons have the title Lord prefixed to the Christian and surname, for instance Lord Alfred Osborne, Lord Henry Somerset. It is extremely incorrect to call either of these Lord Osborne or Lord Somerset. The daughters of dukes, marquises, and earls have the title Lady before their Christian and surname, Lady Emily Heneage for instance, must not be addressed as Lady Heneage. Should she marry a commoner, only the surname is altered. The Lady Emily remains. This may all appear a little involved to those unaccustomed to titles, but neglect of these forms indicates very clearly a lack of savoir-faire. It is a source of great annoyance to the owners of courtesy titles to have the Christian name omitted. Anybody, even a knight's wife, may be a Lady Smith or Jones, the insertion of the Christian name before the Smith or Jones means that the possessor is the daughter of a duke, marquis, or earl. Beginning a letter to the above. In beginning a letter to any of the above, a stranger would say, Dear Lady Mary Smith, but the usual form would be Dear Lady Mary. Inferiors would begin by writing the lady's title over the word Madam, or merely beginning Madam and writing the title at the end of the letter. To an ambassador with conclusion. In writing to an ambassador or his wife, the title is placed above the words Sir or Madam. Inferiors would write, May it please your excellency, and would conclude with, I have the honor to be your excellency's most humble, obedient servant. An archbishop. In writing to an archbishop, a correspondent would begin your grace, ending, I remain your grace's most obedient servant. A bishop. To a bishop, the form would be, My lord or right reverend sir, or may it please your lordship, the last being, of course, the humblest form of address. The conclusion would be, I remain, my lord, or right reverend sir, your most obedient servant. A dean. The beginning of a letter to a dean would be reverend sir, or Mr. Dean, the title of all these dignitaries being in formal letters indicted above the beginning. Those having slight acquaintance would begin, dear Mr. Dean. Strangers would end the letter, I have the honor to be your most obedient servant. Doctors of Divinity. 
Doctors of Divinity are addressed as Reverend Sir, as well as Archdeacons and all other clergy. Intimates would begin letters to the above with Dear Archbishop, Dear Bishop, Dear Dean, or Dear Doctor. Officers in the Army With the sole exception of lieutenants in the Army, all officers have their military rank prefixed to their name, and signs and lieutenants are addressed as Esquire. A Navy Letters of Condolence a very unusual fault committed is to begin by dilating upon the shock or grief felt by the writer. The absurdity of this becomes apparent when one compares mentally the shock or grief as felt by the recipient. Two lines conveying the expression of sympathy are better than pages of even the most eloquent composition. Mourners require all their fortitude in times of loss, and anything likely to impair their self-command is the reverse of a kindness. In this connection, it may be as well to remark that about a week after the funeral, it is customary to call and leave cards of inquiry. When these are responded to by cards of thanks for inquiries, it is a sign that the family is willing to receive callers. Thanks for joining me this week on the American Wordsmith channel. If you found value in this show, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on AmericanWordsmith.com, where you can buy my novels, The Paper Pusher, the Dormant Age, A Man of Silence, and A Man of Action. Be sure to tune in next week for a new episode. Take care.